Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Heads Up, the weekly podcast of the National Headache Foundation. I'm Dr. Lindsay Weitzel, migraine strategist, founder of the Facebook group Migraine Nation, and chronic daily migraine survivor. I'm extremely excited because I'm here this week with Dr. Amy Gelfand. She is the director of the Pediatric Headache Clinic at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. Hi, Dr. Gelfand. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Well, thank you for being here. We have Dr. Gelfand here today because we have a very interesting topic, and she has published a lot in this area. We are going to talk about certain episodic syndromes that occur in children that are related to the future development of pediatric migraine and migraine in general. Uh, an example of this is colic. I think that's the one people have heard of most often. And that's the one we're going to start with, is talking about how colic can be related to the future development of migraine. So Dr. Gelfand, can you please start by just telling us what colic is because I I'm not sure that everyone really un fully understands it. Sure. So of course all babies cry, but colicky babies cry more. So a certain percentage of babies, somewhere between five and about twenty percent of babies, when they get to be about two weeks old, just start being really fussy. They tend to cry most in the evenings. It can be inconsolable, really hard um, for everyone involved, and they'll just fuss and fuss and fuss. And then by about age three months, they. Uh, quiet down and, and seem to outgrow that. So that's what's called infant colic. Okay. Um, so it looks like, I mean, in your research and, and, and I think in other research also, um, there seems to be an association between having colic as a baby and then future development of migraine. Can you please talk to us about that? Yeah, so there have been several studies that have looked at this now. And um, at first, some retrospective studies where children who had migraine during childhood, their parents reported that a higher proportion of them had been colicky as babies than children who did not have migraine in childhood. And then subsequent to that, um, a prospective population-based study was done where uh, babies were determined to either be colicky or not during their infancy and then followed prospectively. And at age 18, it was measured whether or not they had migraine. And those who had been colicky as babies were more than twice as likely to have migraine without aura by age 18. They were not more likely to have migraine with aura, which is interesting. There might be some genetic differences there, but they were more likely to have migraine without aura by the age of 18. Okay. Is there any, do we know of a reason this could be? Has anyone elucidated a mechanism of why colic might be related to migraine? Right. So I will hypothesize a mechanism and say that we don't yet really know, but okay. um, I think that uh, babies who are colicky are babies who have inherited genes for migraine. And we know that people with migraine, their brains are more sensitive to stimuli, both during attacks and between attacks, internal stimuli, external stimuli. And so I think that these babies, when they're experiencing so many new stimuli for the first time, when they're um, born and, and in those first few weeks of life, when their abilities to perceive stimuli are ramping up incredibly quickly. So Take vision just as one example. When a baby's first born, they don't have fantastically great vision, but over just a few weeks of exposure to seeing things, their visual acuity really ramps up quickly. So they're taking in more and more stimuli in those by you know age two or three weeks than they were even in the delivery room. So I think that babies who have inherited migraine genes, they're just more sensitive to stimuli and they're overwhelmed by a long day of stimulation. And I think that's why they're crying and fussing at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think as they get a little bit older and maybe start to be able to consolidate sleep and recover, maybe they can handle that better and colic resolves. That's a hypothesis, though, we don't really know. Right. It's a very interesting hypothesis, and I think that so many people haven't heard it before, and it's very important that people hear it, I think. Um, so there's also some interesting associations that you have found in your research between um, a mother's migraine history and the, their child getting colic. Can you talk about that association? 
Yes. So we have found now in, in two separate studies that mothers who have migraine are more likely to have colicky infants. Mm -hmm. And it looks like the higher the mother's migraine frequency, the higher that risk of having a baby with colic. And I think that the mechanism, again, is that transfer of genes um, mm -hmm. of being uh, a mother who has migraine has those migraine genes and then they, they transfer. And I think that's why the baby is fussing so much. Um, and the ways that I think that this information can be helpful are that um, if a woman is pregnant or, or planning pregnancy, I think it might be helpful to just know that this might happen, the baby may be fussy, and to know that it's not her fault. It's not anything about um, her mothering interaction that isn't working for the baby or that she's doing anything wrong as a mother. It's just the way that, that the baby's brain is processing stimuli and it will get better. Colic is a time limited phenomenon. It will not be like that forever. It will pass um, because sometimes it can be really frustrating when taking care of a, of a fussy baby. And sometimes people just need to take a deep breath, put the baby right. down in the crib and, and just, uh, take a little break. Yeah, especially if you're a mom who has migraine and you're taking yeah. care of a, a fussy baby. I think it's super important that we support these moms and we let them know that this is something that could happen and we give them resources. Yes. Um, so let's talk about, there are a few other syndromes, at least four, that can occur in childhood that are associated with the future development of migraine. And let's just quickly discuss what they are. The first one, I think uh, some people already know about, it's abdominal migraine. I know that I had this a little bit when I was young. Uh, what is it and how likely are we to get uh, migraine as we grow if we have it? Sure, so abdominal migraine typically affects school age children. So let's say six or seven year olds and can go for several years. It can also happen in adults, but uh, I'm giving you the most typical situation for a pediatric migraine doctor to see. Right. Um, and the episodes will be abdominal pain, usually dull or just sore, diffuse sort of everywhere, abdominal pain. Um, sometimes associated with light sensitivity or sound sensitivity or nausea, mm -hmm. um, not wanting to eat, being kind of pale, and the episodes can last for several hours to several days. And what, what I found is interesting is that if that starts around age six or seven, the child might have episodes like that for a couple of years, and then maybe around age 10 or so, they start to also experience head pain when they're having those abdominal pain episodes. Mm -hmm. And then by 12 or 13, it's really become the head pain and the nausea and the mm -hmm. sensitivity, and the abdominal part has often resolved. Um, so I think it's really interesting to watch the way that migraine expresses itself really evolve like that over the course of development. In terms of the absolute risk of um, if you have abdominal migraine going on to get migraine when older, we still don't really know. Um, but my general impression is that it's more likely than not. Okay. Um, so let's look at uh, cyclic vomiting syndrome, which, um, gosh, it's a difficult thing. It, uh, yeah, when people have it, it can be very miserable. So let's talk about um, its relationship to the development of migraine in a person. Yeah, so cyclic vomiting syndrome bears some similarities to abdominal migraine, but what I think is really different is that um, there's very prominent vomiting, many episodes, sometimes multiple episodes per hour, and they come with a periodicity that is reliable for that person. So it's not just vomiting at random. It's, you know, every six weeks I get an episode and uh, it goes for a certain amount of time and then it stops. Although the frequency of those episodes do sometimes change slowly over time as the person develops. But um, I think that really characterizes cyclic vomiting syndrome is different from abdominal migraine. The other thing that I often hear with cyclic vomiting syndrome is that it wakes the, the child up out of sleep at a certain time. They'll say um, between midnight and 2 a.m., she'll wake up with the vomiting and it, that's the way it starts. Um, so yes, this can be a very difficult uh, treat, uh, syndrome to be uh, faced with. And again, in terms of the absolute risk of going on to develop migraine, we don't, we don't really know. Um, that's certainly an area where we need more research. How old are kids usually if they, when they develop cyclic vomiting syndrome, if they have it? On average, around age five-ish. Okay. All right. So there's something else that's a little less common, and I bet pe less people know about. It's called benign paroxysmal vertigo. 
Uh, what is that and why is it related to migraine? Right. So this is a syndrome that usually affects preschool age children, so age two or three years old. And it's characterized by very brief attacks, maybe two or five minutes long, where all of a sudden the child will just look scared. They might go down to the ground, look like they suddenly got off balance as if they've just come off of a merry-go-round or something like that. Um, and then it'll pass and they'll be completely fine. And they might have one every couple of weeks for two years and then they outgrow it around age four or five. Um, and again, we don't really know the absolute risk of, of going on to develop um, migraine in childhood, but it does seem from uh, case series and the data that do exist that kids who have benign paroxysmal vertigo as, as young ones do seem to be more likely to get migraine as kids than kids who don't have it. Okay. And our last one we're going to talk about today uh, has a similar name. It's benign paroxysmal torticollis of infancy. Can you tell us what that is? Yes. So uh, this one affects infants, usually starts around age four or five months of age. And what happens with benign paroxysmal torticollis is that they get episodes of head tilt. So it might go to the right and then the next episode, it goes to the left. Mm -hmm. And during the head tilt episodes, they can look pale. They might not want to eat. They can be fussy. And if they're old enough to crawl or walk, they can be off balance, something we call ataxia. Um, and sometimes this will last for a couple of hours or it might even go for a few days mm -hmm. and it might make it a little bit difficult for the child to advance in terms of their gross motor development because they're spending a fair amount of time tilted. Yeah. But they oh. do usually seem to catch up. This, this, from what we can tell, is probably the rarest of these episodic syndromes that we're talking about, um, but does again, seem to be associated with going on to develop migraine when older. And this is one where we have a little more information, which is that some children who have benign paroxysmal torticollis have been found to have one of the gene mutations that is associated with familial hemiplegic migraine, the kind of migraine where you get weak on one side with attacks. Mm -hmm. um, there's a gene called the CACNA1A uh, mutation. It's a calcium channel mutation. And uh, there is an association between benign paroxysmal torticollis and that, uh, that mutation. So do they specifically usually get hemiplegic migraine as they get older? That's a really good question. I think we still don't totally know. Not and sure. I should say that okay. not all of them have that particular mutation. Okay. That's probably just one of the genes that can cause benign paroxysmal torticollis. There's certainly a number of babies with benign paroxysmal torticollis who've been tested for that gene and don't have it. So there must be other ones that can also do it. Okay. That was a very informative episode. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Is there anything else that you think people should know about uh, episodes that can occur in, or excuse me, um, syndromes that can occur in childhood and their relationship to development of migraine? Um, I think we, we certainly need more research to understand prognosis better and especially treatment better. Um, in the meantime, if somebody is having a difficult time with these attacks, I think it's reasonable to think about using acute migraine treatments that would be used to treat migraine headaches in these age groups. Mm -hmm. For example, if, if they have an episode of abdominal migraine in a seven-year-old, we might think about using a triptan or an NSAID to help with that. And I think that it is reasonable to think about those treatments in these situations now, and hopefully we can have more formal studies done in the future. Okay, I think that's a very, very good point. Um, if your child is is having these things, definitely talk to your doctor. And um, if migraine runs in your family, this is a conversation that you should have. Um, yeah, so anyways, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Gelfon, and thank you everyone for joining us on this week's episode of Heads Up. We would like everyone to know that the National Headache Foundation has a hotline that you can call if you have questions about your migraine disorder, you can call 888-NHF-5552. That is 888-643-5552. And someone at the National Headache Foundation will do their very best to get you an answer about any really burning question you might have related to your headache disorder or the headache disorder of someone in your family. So thank you so much, everyone. And we will see you next week on Heads Up. Bye-bye.